If I could please have your attention, bring it back to the tent. We have a big treat for you. The next two guests need no introduction. Lando Norris, one round of applause, right? One of the most incredible drivers in the world. Lando, thank you for being here with us. I'm gonna put you right here. We also have Stephanie Dobbs Brown, the Chief Marketing Officer of the New York Stock Exchange. Give it up for Stephanie Dobbs Brown. Same, same level, same, same, same. All right, so I've never done this before, but we're gonna do a prank. All of us are gonna do a prank. So we are waiting for Zach Brown, the CEO of McLaren Racing. <laughs> and Lou, their CMO of McLaren Racing. And so what the prank is, is because they are late, I'm going to make Zach show us one of his tattoos. <laughs> he does not know that that is coming. So when I ask him to show the tattoo, I want everyone in the audience to go, oh. <laughs> and he's gonna have no idea why that's your reaction, okay? <laughs> awesome, let's get started. All right, so one of the interesting things about the New York Stock Exchange and Lando Norris is that both of them represent living out the dream. For NYSC, it's the dream of capitalism. It's making it to the big market. It's making it to the big American public market. For Lando, it's focus. It's having a dream early on, staying dedicated to it, and paying off. Congratulations on all of your success, Lando. Uh, but the one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that that focus cannot waver. It has to be a dream from the beginning and you have to live it out. Lando, when did you know that this was the career that you wanted to choose and pursue? And when did you decide, okay, this is it, this is my life? Uh, well, uh, afternoon everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. So, uh, a long, long time ago, started, um, I mean, I got into racing when I was six, seven, uh, and that's pretty much the age you got to start at, I think nowadays in, in sports. Um, if you want to make it to be one of the best. Uh, so many people want to try to be one of the best, no matter what their job is or their sport is. Um, almost the younger you can start, the better it is nowadays. So six, seven, I, I fell in love with racing. Uh, probably when I was 13, 14 was the first time I, I think I was probably old enough to... I had to make a ch choice. It's an easy choice for me. Uh, whether I wanted to go to school or <laughs> if I wanted to go racing. Um, and I... I chose racing, surprisingly. So uh, that was actually my first say, big decision on my life that I had to choose on, on kind of what I, I wanted to do. Um, and you've got to stick with it, you know, if you want to be the best. And it's hard to know that when you're a kid, like if you want to reach the top, the dedication, the time, um, the sacrifices you've got to make, you know, make along the way. Um, but it all ended up to be, to be worth it. So it's been um, an amazing journey, but I think... Um, there's just a lot of things that happen along the way that you just don't know, f you know, didn't know about, and you don't know how to prepare for that kind of thing. Um, What's an example of that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just uh, the the effort level. Simply, the effort level you got to put in, uh, time, um, dedication to be the best of your profession. You know, to to figure out what can make you better every day, because uh, it's it's an endless pursu pursuit. Of of uh, perfection, you know. Every every day is uh, what more can I do to to be better? Can I improve in this area? Can I improve in that area? Um, and I've never been the one that's how, like I've never had the most faith in myself. That's just the way I've always been. Um, I've never been the most overconfident that kind of thing. But uh, so I never knew I was going to be an F1, and I was always had the doubt. But I never knew until uh, I actually signed my contract in in uh, 20, 2018. So. That was the final thing, like, okay, now I've, now I've made it, and my next chapter starts of being in Formula One. Um, but I've always struggled with that. Like, uh, I struggled with, you know, the, the self-confidence, that kind of thing. But um, just, the like I said, the dedication of every, every day, what can I do better, what can I do more to improve myself to make that uh, goal become a reality. What do you think has helped to improve your self-confidence since you joined F1 in 2018? <laughs> Winning? Winning helps, yeah. <laughs> Winning helps, um, but I only did that this year, so. Uh, Woo, congratulations to Lando Norris. So, um, I think many things can help. Um, 
I was just just speaking about it, but like uh, having a good group of people around me, they've been there to support me the whole way. So I've had my bad days and weeks and months of when things have not gone my way and I'm like, I know this isn't the right thing for me. This is, I'm not doing good enough, that kind of thing, which I think is completely reasonable to have. And I think uh, everyone, no matter what their work is or their job is, probably doubts themselves at times on, you know, I'm not cut out for this. I don't think I'm doing a good enough job. But um, I've always been lucky that I've had those people to kind of fall back on and, um, in that small little bubble that I travel with, my trainer, my manager, my dad, my, my family, um, like they're always there to kind of give me a you know, little helping hand and, um, and keep supporting me. Um, and I've even worked, you know, I worked with um, psychologists and, and mental coaches uh, to help with these things too, because I think that's a completely normal and, and valid thing to be able for, for people to do. So um, I've worked with them and uh, it was a big problem of mine, it was like that self-confidence and self-belief. But um, once I kind of got into a role of knowing how I can work better, how I can actually do a better job, then I started performing better. When I perform better, I'm like, okay, I want to work more for it and I want to work harder. And I kind of get into this perfect spiral of the harder I work, the more I accomplish, the more I accomplish, the happier I am. Um, and uh, that kind of just, uh, yeah, goes in a spiral in, in a good way, which is a, is a nice thing perfect spiral in my mind that looks like a spiral that goes up like this yeah. just constantly going up stephanie new york stock exchange is a partner to mclaren mm -hmm. we obviously all know drive to survive we know that this is becoming such a big trend but that doesn't mean that every brand is jumping on it why are you jumping on it yeah. so we uh, first of all thank you for having me of course i love that you get both of us so we want the same level of applause and enthusiasm <laughs> that's right <laughs> Um, so we we part we started to partner with McLaren around the time that Drive to Survive was um, was starting to blow up, um, and for us we were trying to do two things. One was we wanted to modernize the NYSC brand, and the second was we needed to reach just broader audiences. And so sport was a natural avenue for us to, to look at and explore. But McLaren, that audience connection, you know, the sophisticated audience, the brand appeal of McLaren, the winning uh, just mentality of McLaren was uh, the, the sort of obvious reason to partner. Look who joined. Oh, look who decided to <laughs> show. Hey, good. Thank you so much for joining. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Monaco <laughs> All right, a round of applause for Louise and Zach right. from McLaren. You guys did not miss much, but let me catch you up real quick. So, I was I was oh, <laughs> excuses, excuses. Exactly. Yeah, learned it from Lando. <laughs> we talked to Lando about his journey. We talked about self-confidence, investing in mental health, and the positive spiral in which you work hard, you win, you get more success. You work hard, you win, you get more success, and how that focus has fueled his career. And Stephanie was talking to us about why she wants to partner with McLaren on behalf of the New York Stock Exchange. She basically said they needed to broaden their appeal. What better way to do that than sport? And the momentum around F1 and raising made it just an easy choice. So let's talk to you two for a second. I want to understand the Explosive popularity around F1. A lot of people attribute it to the Drive to Survive Netflix show, but I think it's more than that. I think F1 has become like a bat signal for people who care about the intersection of culture, sport. That's what it really is about. What do you think drove this historic momentum for racing? Uh, I think the inclusivity of Formula One's Formula One's always been awesome. It's always had everything that you see on Netflix: politics, great drivers racing around the world, speed, big money, etc. Uh, it's always had that uh, theater to it. But what Formula One hadn't done is open up the stage and and let everyone in. Uh, Netflix did uh, certainly played a huge role in, in that. But the sport under the ownership of Liberty. Uh, changed. I think when they uh, acquired the sport, they saw here's the world's largest annual uh, sport that is untapped in many, many ways. And so what they did when they came in is they started to shift the mentality uh, of, of the sport to become much more inclusive as opposed to exclusive, which did work for some people if you could play in the exclusive 
uh, category, if you would like, but uh, the world's much larger, and being inclusive is a much better uh, approach. And so Netflix, I think, brought that to hundreds of millions of people. Uh, it drove three uh, new audiences in, in uh, geographies, North America, uh, which is kind of the sporting capital uh, of the world, if you'd like, and Formula One was, was nowhere. Uh, women and youth, and if you looked at what Formula One needed uh, before Liberty acquired, it was kind of, those would have been top three on the list, and then pl plenty of other uh, items, and so it's it's great the sport is where it is. It's very, uh, it's very exciting. I think it's going from strength to strength, because beyond that, we have now um, fiscal sustainability. The teams are now profitable. You had teams going out of business before. Now you have people trying to get into the sport and we're saying uh, no. All the teams uh, franchise value is starting to catch up with other major league sports. So I think uh, outside of the show that we're putting on, the fundamentals to put on a good show, having a healthy business, Liberty helped change that business model as well. So I think in many ways the sport's very young uh, in the next era of uh, what we should be able to put on for the fans. I love that you mentioned it's young because it implies there's a lot of opportunity ahead. We are here celebrating the business of women's sports specifically, and McLaren has a women's driver, Bianca. Uh, Louise, walk me through the opportunity, to Zach's point, for growth in women race car drivers. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, Bianca Bissamate is obviously our Formula One Academy driver. I think uh, Formula One have d done a great job in, in making sure Formula One Academy c becomes part of that core racing agenda and putting it on at races alongside our other Formula One drivers, really raising that agenda and the profile um, of its racing. We're obviously hugely committed to that and very proud of, of having Bianca race for us this year. And just to say that when we announced Bianca, we kind of, we knew we had a great fan base. Uh, we have a lot of disproportionate female fans actually, I think, from that from that new audience that you mentioned. When we announced Bianca's uh, racing for us, uh, which was last year in Austin, we were quite taken aback. Out of all of our driver announcements, even yourself, Lando, uh, Bianca's announcement outperformed any other driver announcement, and that was really incredible. It actually gives me goosebumps. When, when that message went out, it was kind of really important, big statement for us as a team, actually. And actually, the way that our fans responded was, was quite incredible. Did you pull any research as to why you got that outsized response? Uh, I think with Bianca, she, she's a great driver. She has her own great profile. She's very, very in touch with uh, Gen Z and the TikTok generation. So she had a great profile herself. But I think also through um, our fantastic fan base that we've listened to, I think, quite a lot over the years, uh, we've had great female fandom. Even before Bianca, I think we had that disproportionate share of fans. So we knew what appealed to them. And female fans... They like the same things. They still like the pit stops. Um, they also like our two fantastic drivers that we've got in Oscar, Oscar and Lando. Um, but they tune into slightly different things. And I, I think from a, females tend to like the, the human performance ele element behind a pit stop. They might not be so into the technical detail. And so I think when we're putting content out there now, we're really listening to what those female fans want. And uh, it's not to say they don't want they don't want us to win, but they just there's a s small differences. So I think making sure that we test and learn that when we put content out I is great, and and it's working. Lando, when you were coming up in the sport, were you making friends with, in touch with, uh, women that were trying to come up with you? And if so, like, do you keep in touch with them? What does that community look like for you? Yeah, I mean, there there's few, um, which genuinely I think is the biggest issue of, of not seeing more in, in racing in the first place. Um, there's too few getting into it in you know the, the early ages of six, seven, eight years old, um, which I think is where we've seen the most influence now of, of Netflix and Drive to Survive and that kind of thing, and um, having that opportunity for, for, for girls and ladies to be in, in Formula One. Um, that I think is a more of a focus to not you know twenty to forty year olds, but is is that focus to to kids is to get more of them in the first place. And I raced against um, Jamie Chadwick, who uh, is now uh, racing out in in Indy Lights, um, and uh, and um, that was when I was like thirteen, fourteen, and she's incredible. She's gone on. She's I think won the last race or or something. So. She um she's showing 
the girls what they can do against the guys, and I think that's uh, a great thing. That's what we that's what we want. You know, we would be very happy for for that kind of thing. And uh, I think what we need to push for is is just to to get more to start in the first place. You know, um, because everyone you see in Formula One and in Formula Two, they started when they were five, six, seven years old. Um, they're not starting when they're 15 all of a sudden and then trying to get into it because that's just not how sports work nowadays. So um, trying to to um, approach that younger generation, and it feels weird for me saying that at 24, but um, <laughs> <laughs> trying to, to, to influence that and, you know, have Bianca and, and that kind of thing to, to, yeah, be on TikTok and those kind of things. And for a six, seven, eight-year-old, 10-year-old, seeing that on Formula One, uh, seeing that on TV and watching the Formula One, that's exactly where, where things have improved so much and will hopefully continue to improve. So... Um, there's no reason why they shouldn't be anymore. It's just there aren't enough uh, starting in the first place, and I think that's where we've tried to tackle things the most. Stephanie, as a marketer, mm -hmm. like, what do you think needs to be done to help get young women exposed so that they can start in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's a few things. I think some is F1. I think some of it is just broadly and in, in general. I think so much of the, the fandom that comes with, with women and the storytelling, like that's so relatable. And I think we see that across the board when we're talking about women's sports, when we think about how you have to market women's sports, content and storytelling is so important in general, right? When we're talking about uh, engaging um, from a, a sports perspective or a marketing perspective, it's that much more when we're talking about women. And so we've hosted over the last um, eight or nine months, we've also, as part of our sports strategy, um, or our strategy really to modernize the NYSC brand and to reach more audiences, our approach within sports, some of it was is McLaren, um, and some of it's around women's sports. Um, when you think about the NYSC, we, we also sort of sit at this, this intersection of culture and capital. So what is more culturally relevant than sports? And for us, we're trying to target women we want women who are founders, entrepreneurs, we want them thinking about listing on the, the NYSC. We also, if you think about girls and women who play in sports when they're younger, the impact that that has on their leadership um, later in life, that is obviously important to us at the NYSC in terms of the ecosystem we operate in. And then the third thing, it's, it's just freaking good for business. Like women's sports is good for business. Uh, it is the potential for it to be an economic driver is something that again, is really interesting for us. So I think it's leaning into the fandom and telling those stories. And I think that's, you know, if you if you see it, you you can be it. And I think that that's important. Women's sports is good for business. Let's get a round of applause for that, right? <laughs> Theme of the week. Right. <laughs> Zach, how is getting women engaged in racing good for your business? Um, I believe in diversity of, uh, of, of thought contribution. And so that diversity, whether that's you know gender or race or religion, uh, I think ultimately uh, any good leader wants to be surrounded by a bunch of people that have different views. And then you you gather those views and you come together and you make the best decision. But I think if you everyone at the table has the same view, that might not be the diversity of thought you need in this you know very global world because people. Uh, have different perspectives uh, on life, and you want to you want to hear that. So it's you know our if I look at our workforce, not long ago about 13 percent was underrepresented. That's now uh, north of 20 percent. The majority of that is is women, and we want to double that by the end of the decade. And I think it's just going to make us a better uh, better racing team, you know, on the track and off the track. And I think it's important. When we talk about drivers. <clears throat> that's obviously the most um, famous part, if you'd like, of, uh, you know, if we can get a, a very successful woman in Formula One, I think it's not just about getting fe females in Formula One to winning, going for the world championship, that would be uh, unbelievable, uh, but also mechanics and marketing and engineers, and so we need to, as Lando said, we need to raise the awareness at a younger age. Um, we've created a program called 60 Scholars. We're in year two. I don't know if that was covered off on earlier, but it, uh, uh, young women ages 18 to 23 around STEM, because obviously STEM is very important to uh, McLaren. And so uh, it would be great to have a, a racing driver, but we want as many uh, people from diverse backgrounds uh, 
throughout our thousand employees at, at McLaren. And uh, first thing we need to do is just raise awareness. So at a very young age, you know, it's it was about, I remember when I got into racing, it was, you know, me, dad, I want to go to the racetrack. And so we need to get it to the point where more people are going, mom, dad, I want to go to the racetrack. And it's not always a six-year-old boy, but it's a six-year-old, six-year-old uh, a girl. Um, and, and I think by raising awareness, I'm seeing so much of like Netflix, and I think that's where it has uh, been a big benefit. Can't tell you how often people now stop us and they say, my daughter, my wife, my sister is a huge fan of, of Formula One, and that's usually coming from the dad or the husband or the, the brother, and it's pretty awesome, and that didn't happen uh, five years ago. So you can definitely see it's going that direction, and we just need to continue to kind of bring awareness, double down on it, and I think the shape of Formula One and women in sports in general will look a lot different and a lot better in five, ten years' time. So that's a great segue into a question I was going to ask. You obviously don't have a crystal ball, but you're thinking, okay, it's going to be a lot better in five, ten years' time. Like, when do we get our first female F1 driver? Is that in the near future, in the long future? I think it'll take a little bit of time because it, if if you look at uh, for every one Lando, there's ten thousand drivers that try and be Lando, and where you can see it is uh, pre Lando. I'd go to the kart track. And half the kids were like Lewis or Jensen, and now we're going to have at the kart track. So that's Lando. There's going to be 20 Landos running around the racetrack. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it takes time, right? Lando started at six, seven years old. I, I think if you look at the funnel, um, there's no one at the, you know, close to the top tier yet. So we need to kind of start now at the grassroots level. So knowing that it takes, you know, 10 years to go from, you know, eight, nine years old to be knocking on the door at Formula One and 18, 19 years old, you know, we're, we're probably at least five years away from a Formula One perspective because there's not enough uh, uh, female drivers that are, you know, 12, 13, 14 right now, which is where they need to be. There definitely are some, but we need to increase, increase the volume. So we're, we're a good five years away. Five years is pretty hopeful. So we are out of time, but one of the members of your team said that I should ask you about your Miami tattoo and said that I should ask if I could see it. Yeah, all right. Oh. <laughs> oh. Hey, you oh. oh, there we go. We love it, we love it. Uh, Zach, Louise, Stephanie, Lando, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, just a really great conversation. And uh, Lando, I really appreciated you talking about mental health and confidence and working with a psychiatrist. I think that's very inspiring for a lot of people here. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange brand wanted to modernize. There is no better way to do it. I like that you said that liberty has really shifted the mentality around the sport. And I didn't realize that you know it's the world's largest annual sport. It's absolutely massive. Um, Netflix definitely brought the rise, but there were other factors as well. The um, F1 sort of focus right now is not just bringing women into driving, but it's bringing them in through STEM and commitment to mechanics and all of these other roles that are surrounding it. Um, Louisa, I think you saying that the Bianca announcement outperformed all announcements, sorry Lando, is a huge inspiration for the opportunity for bringing women in here. Uh, and finally, you know, I asked Zach, how long till we get our first female F1 driver? I mean, five years, that is in the near future, and we are looking forward to that day whenever it comes. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Thank you, everyone.